it occurred to me that Ovid's Metamorphoses is a set of fables that talks about the nature of the Iron Age, the age we live in. Americans have no real conception of history. That itself is really a set of slogans that justifies the current regime. Ovid is is someone uh, worth reading. Much of what we know of, of Roman mythology comes from him. He lived roughly at the time of Christ, so he's in a revolutionary era in every way. And of course, Ovid's writing at a time when Rome was a military empire, no longer a republic. Well, the empire, I think, was far more just than, than the republic was. The republic was a, an oligarchy, as all republics are. So the empire was based on the idea of a strong emperor, but the republic based on the oligarchy of the Senate. And Ovid was a royalist. When you read the Metamorphoses, and of course, you know, this is, this is what the framers of the Constitution, whether they were in favor of it or not, this is what they knew very well. The whole concept of literacy in the 18th century was whether or not you can read and write Greek and Latin and know the stories and know the history. That was the very nature of political literacy. If you didn't know that, you didn't know anything. That's what political science was, was the understanding of, of Greco-Roman tradition. And I want to talk about all of his metamorphosis because he talks about that he, he, as, as all ancient understandings of history were, it was devolutionary. You know, evolution came with um, the linear view of history from uh, the Enlightenment, uh, you know, from Plutarch to to Darwin, and it's a you know, it's, it's a point of view that's that's um, in the interest of of industry and, and mercantile capitalism. Well, mercantile capitalism was repressed by the emperor and put under very strict limits. Of course, one of the first things the emperor did was limit usury. But when you see a a display like that first so-called presidential debate. And it's not just that it, that it's, that it's infantile, not just that it was absolutely mindless, but that was planned to be that way. That the, the campaign staffs got together and mapped this out. You can't just start talking over a moderator. They could have just turned the microphones off if they, if he wanted to control it. You know, I don't even think a buzzer would work. They could have turned the microphones off if, if it was getting out of hand. There was a million things that they could have done to control it, but they did not. And when you see something like that, you want to start looking at origins. How did the regime fail so miserably? How did it create this disgusting display? And you'll have people that, and it's even worse than that, because then you'll have idiots talk about what these people just said and how significant it was and what this means in the polls. All pure uh, ignorance and manipulation. There's absolutely no functional knowledge here, and that is not their job. Their job is to tell a story. The Four Ages of Humanity, um, in Ovid's point of view, and it became pretty standard. The Golden Age, which was your age of innocence, um, very similar to, to Eden. I mean, all, all traditions have, have an Eden where knowledge was intuited, not grasped through concepts, which is a, a matter of alienation. Then that the occasion to the Silver Age, where culture and morals are dominant. This is development of conceptual thinking. Then that the occasion to the Bronze Age of warfare, but at least the, the warrior um, ethos is alive. And then the Iron Age of total and constant war at every level with no morals governing even that. The Iron Age is where language is used to deceive. And of course, all morals are deemed relative. It's, it's the era of sophistry. I think we're beyond that. Um, I don't even want to call it the fecal age or whatever it is, but it's way beyond this because it's fully understood that language is used to deceive. It's fully understood that people with power are lying and have no right to be where they are. We live at the very worst of the Iron Age, moving from intuition to concept in how we know things, the falling away from unity. Conceptual logic alienates. It separates us from the world. But the Bronze and Iron Age, even that had broken down, and Hobbes' war of all against all develops. There's no truth at all except life and death. God, not even taxes were guaranteed at the time, only death. This is where Hobbes' state of nature comes from. But beyond the historical scheme, the metamorphosis is the story of constant radical change, based again on the idea of devolution. The old Roman idea, the Stoic idea, man came from matter, and from this he developed rationality, and he adapts to his environment. That's what the metamorphosis is, ultimately, symbolized by divine intervention. When I say divine, you know, uh, as I've said many times before, the, the gods weren't meant to be real, weren't understood that way. These are archetypes. They're symbols of higher truths that otherwise would be very difficult for simple people to understand. Which in and of itself is worth discussing because not even, you know, only a handful of people could be an actual scholar. You know, as Plato would put it, I mean, you, 
after you know the the abstract scholarship, but for simple people to understand the same truths, you have to put it in symbolic form. The truths are the same, but it's put in 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 greater and greater uh, levels of simple symbolism, um, and no more than that. Now, everyone from the most ignorant to the most knowledgeable is on a level playing field, um, allegedly making the same argument. And again, even that's fully understood as deceitful. It's not denied. Third, because of all of this, no situation is ever stable. All is flux and becoming. But all of his view is that you know, all things are changing for the worse. Uh, and human history, which is symbolized by the totality of, of Greek myth, is the story of denigration and degeneration. Negative change is a motion from pristine simplicity of nature and humanity in the golden age to the arrogant, violent, and elitist world of today and, and in all of its time. Uh, gold symbolizes the sun, uh, symbolized by the sun. Um, I'm sorry, symbolizing the sun, I should put it. Decays into silver, which is the moon. Bronze, warfare, which is based on, on Mars. And iron, sometimes uh, associated with Saturn. And the, the decay even of that goes into lead, which is often also associated with, with Saturn. Saturn is the idea of, of Saturn, um, it's, it's a metal of separation. The sign of Saturn separates man from God, ushers into the end of the Silver Age into a more rapid degeneration. Fourth, one of the most important symbols is the story of God's raping human women. It comes up over and over again. Um, it's a symbol of civilization. Nature, water, flower, whatever. These are almost all universal symbols of, of woman. Nature before civilization was pristine and pure. As the Silver Age degenerated and decayed, nature was then seen as an arena where oligarchs can build cities, and these cities violate the natural order. These cities exist to concentrate labor. They're fortified against their many enemies. They're based on class rule. Cities came into existence to have a massive pool of cheap labor close by, and taking them from the countryside and their families, they're broken with tradition, and they become completely alienated. This is the point of a city. Fifth, Ovid's metamorphosis is about power. I'm not talking about authority, we're talking about power. It corrupts everything it touches. Love turns to rape. Politics turns to war. Communities turn to just collective egos. Money goes from the medium of exchange to a power in its own right, something even fetishized. Earth and nature turn to exploita uh, exploitation for gain, mining, um, large-scale farming, all requiring sacrifice. Power is the engine of change, and the very core of everything that, that Albert is talking about in the metamorphosis. But if it's changed, it's changed for the worse. Errors are collective. Uh, and there was a concept of revolution there. The concept of revolution, however, just magnified the nature of the change uh, and how bad it is. The simple idea seemed lost on everybody that any violent revolution um, favors the most amoral, it favors the most violent. It favors the most sociopathic. Therefore, violent revolution always is a change for the worse. So finally, under all appearances, under the images, is confusion. So socially, the state fixes some relatively stable ideology that takes the pandemonium and, and makes some kind of order out, out of it. But when the emperors took over, they did it for two reasons. First, because Rome was split into violent factions under the Republic. You could put names, you know, parties, you could put, you know, right and left and, and, and wax about, uh, uh, poetic about them. But that's all they are. They're, they're oligarchical, um, um, masses used for their own purposes. And secondly, the Republic was pure bedlam. It was ruled by status. There was nothing legitimate about an oligarchy. It's a perversion of aristocracy. And that's why these emperors were usually military men and they use force to place order on chaos. It's the start of the Iron Age. Now, the emperors themselves have done nothing wrong. They've rationally and ruthlessly used force to establish their rule and permit at least the appearance of order. The gods themselves come out of this chaos as man struggles to make sense out of this lack of order. There is order, of course. But at the end of the Bronze Age, all man can see is desire, not nature. This is the main issue. Narcissus is the infamous symbol of this. We get the concept of narcissism from it. It's in Book 3, The Metamorphosis. There's a few things to say about them. Um, apart from the fact that we live in a society drowning in narcissism, narcissism is rewarded and celebrated. But Narcissus himself, first of all, he's a hunter. Hunting in Ovid and in most of the ancient poetry is a symbol for the sex drive. 
This is a form of power and that it turns the object of desire into a thing. The thing uses images to attract somebody to desire it. So it's not based on love, it's based on domination. Second, he's the apogee of the end of the Bronze Age. This is why he is obsessed with his own image. The end of the Bronze Age is even where the military uh, aristocracy begins to break down. And military force is monopolized not by military men, not by men of any kind of honor, but by those with money. They become not soldiers, but mercenaries. Third, in this period of time, physical beauty um, is the ultimate good. Since knowledge has degenerated, and there really is no room for it, Narcissus doesn't know that he sees only the image of himself. He has no objective foundation. He takes the image for reality. Because in our age, there is no distinction. There is no neutral ground to stand on to make the distinction between image and reality, or even talking about reality at all. Now, there's a nymph, um, again, very typical. Her name is Echo. She loved the sound of her own voice, tried to seduce him. And in both you know, arrogance and, and ignorance, he pushes her away, you know, in an alpha style. You know, I could do better. The nymph... Um, meets Nemesis, the god of revenge, and hence created the pool of water. And the water is always female, as hunting is always male. And remember that Zeus had raped her several times, as well as a bunch of other nymphs, but she's as arrogant as Narciss Narcissus is. These aren't different. One's not a victim, the other's a, a... They're all in the same boat. The difference between sex and rape don't matter, because again, there's no ground. One group may be powerful, and therefore can term sex rape, if they're strong enough to do that. Echo, Zeus, and Narcissus are all prideful, arrogant. They can't control their own drives. Now, Nemesis is crafty. Even even here, the distinction between deviousness and intelligence is non-existent. And how easy it is to use Narcissus' own petty obsessions to trap him forever. The ultimate thing is that the image is not even real. It's his reflection. But when knowledge is broken down, the concepts that break us out of the Golden Age, even those have broken down, the referent of the words uh, that we use don't exist, then there's no way to tell the difference between reality and reflection. And that's where we are now. It's also consistent with the nature of images. An image has a role, of course. They can point to it, but they're not truth in their own right. Images are unstable. They're always changing. They're manipulated by the mind of those who create them as well as us who perceive them, both in our perception of them and the people who create them. They're always changing. We stamp our own reality on them. They deceive more than they reveal. It's one thing to have a, a period of alienation in the, in the Silver Age where um, words and reason and logic rule over intuition. That gets more and more crude. And by the end of the Bronze Age, um, language exists to deceive. In other words, knowledge has degenerated to the point where images of things are confused with the things themselves. The image has a word attached to it, and then language takes on a life entirely of its own. The image is what's attached to the word, not the thing it's describing. Clearly, the purpose of me talking about Ovid is pretty obvious. It's really the only way to talk about the the um, disaster of liberal democracy, which has been shoved down our throats tonight. We live in the Iron Age, in the Lead Age, because image is reality. Now, truth, of course, exists behind appearance, and it takes work to uncover it. If you remove self-interest from your cognition, truth is fairly easy to discern. People don't discern it because they don't know how. Whose cognition is very difficult, and they don't want to uncover it. Self-interest is far more significant than truth. But in the iron world, bodies are all that exist. But even that, bodies are cut up into pieces. But whether they like it or not, spirit exists as well. Reason, thought, universal ideas all speak of the existence of spirit. Consciousness itself has to be spirit. Thought does not work orderly. It doesn't work in a, in a cause and effect kind of a way. Therefore, it has to be free. It's not subject to the same... Um, cause and effect structure of anything that's material. But something that is free can't, by definition, be material. The modern regime creates man that is completely helpless over his drives. But this can only be if we are a body and nothing more. Spirit is not of the same substance as bodies, but it animates them. The Romans held logos, Romans at their best, held the logos, the rational structures held the cosmos together. It connects our own cognition to the world around us because it's all one thing. Unreason is unfreedom when we become slaves of our drives. Reason exists to see logos in all things. It's not logic. It may use logic, but they're not the same thing. 
unreason. Irrationality only sees the image. This is two steps away from reality. All you have left, of course, is money. Money dominates everything. It's the most archetypal aspect of it all. So if you were to stumble over a billion dollars lying around somewhere, you would automatically have celebrity status in your own TV show. You'd have hundreds of new friends. You'd have beautiful women everywhere. And of course, it's all based on the fact that you tripped over a billion dollars. Modern Western life is just a far more centralized technological version of life under the late republic. It is infinitely worse because the late republic didn't have pornography available to eight-year-olds, didn't have an ideology that justified all of this, didn't have ideologies that denigrate knowledge and, and, and rationality. Um, it wasn't officially atheist. It wasn't purely materialist. and didn't have this rammed on everyone's throat in the education system. So there is no comparison um, with the late republic and what we have today. But few today know the source of these images that have become so powerful. Back then, Rome was healthy enough that an emperor was able to take power and create some semblance of reality. But if you hold to the cyclical idea that further degeneration is what's necessary for a small minority to rebuild actual nobility. Now, of course, the only nobility is money. And money itself not just changes the world, but it changes the possessor. Um, the story of Daphne desiring to be turned into a laurel branch is early in the metamorphosis. He's setting the universal idea of history where humanity descends from the bronze, even worse, to the Iron Age, the age of Saturn. The story can only be understood to exemplify the lowest of these ages, even lower than iron, because here love is no different than lust and rape. It's the idea that chaos and death underlie all things, no matter how good, no matter how good those things are. It's how reason, symbolized by the sun god, must force its will on the appetites, or the wild nature of woman um, will dominate, and has to, the will has to be forced on it for, or for anything to remain stable. Cupid and Eros, the same same god, of course, commits a cruel act um, of hitting Apollo, or Phoebus, god of the sun, with the arrow that leads to lust, while hitting Daphne with the blunt leaden one that only experiences repulsion. It's a cruel trick. Apollo gets hit with Cupid's arrow of lust. Daphne has the exact opposite. So Cupid, Eros, um, has Apollo pursuing, and the other rejection, utter disdain. But they're both lower drives and passions. They're both equally irrational if they're taken as ends of, ends of themselves. Now, the cruelty here was the first problematic thing to notice, but then Apollo, the representation of the sun and gold, is struck by what amounts to his own arrow, the golden sharp arrow, the symbol of the sun. The gold always is. Yet if gold that is rational is Apollo himself, then it's possible that he's being forced to experience the contradictions, the rise of reason for science and civilization, present. Reason is found in the Silver Age. The Silver Age is when the intuition, the, the um, innocence of the Golden Age breaks down and reason, civilization, science begin to build at its highest level. Ovid all sees everything as a mixture of stable forms and chaotic flux. Reason and the emperor are seen as the same thing. They have to place form on this chaos, force it on this chaos for any knowledge or action to make any sense. It's easy to transfer this to the male imposition of himself upon a woman. And the poem reads concerning Apollo. The king of gods begot me, what shall be, or is or ever was, in fate I see, mine is the invention of the charming lyre, sweet notes, and heavenly numbers I inspire. Those four lines are the foundation of all civilization, numbers building geometry. That they are heavenly refers to the fact that they are ideal. They are inherent in all rational things in civilization, but identical with none of them. The lyre is a, an ancient symbol. It needs to be tuned to the result using skills, rational education, harmony in music, harmony in social life. All is rational, all is ideal. That means all is free. That is, of course, until Apollo was struck by his own arrow. Now, Ovid was subject to two failed marriages, and then loosely connected to a third woman, which lasted for the rest of his life. That is worth mentioning, that he was also raised in the transition from the late Republic to the Empire, as well known, of course but has everything to do with what he's focusing on, the constant changes that he sees constantly all around him. The Old Republic, of course, you know, the late Republic is an oligarchy, pretended to base itself on virtue, while only connected and concerned with slavery, which is what conquest was all about. The new empire was far more egalitarian, and no one missed the overwhelming power of the senators. But the empire, too, 
while a rational result of, of senatorial arrogance, was a step backwards in Aubrey's own sense of, of history. One of the most important ideas is the gods pursuing women, which comes down to, symbolically speaking, rape. But why Apollo, the god of sun and reason? Daphne, the daughter of the ever-changing river, is impervious to reason. That's the connection here. Apollo is a symbol of civilization. On the other hand, nature, moisture, women, plants, are not just symbols for the feminine, but also the state of creation prior to the development of reason. As the Silver Age moved into the lower realms, existence became a domain where warriors create civilization, and thus demand that the natural order give more than she would otherwise. Or this hasn't reached chaotic status yet. But once this happens, they create enemies. These civilizations, based around the fortress, are a crime and are paid for by constant sacrifice, among other things, war and blood. And this is also the rise of child sacrifice and, and you know, the Near East, Moloch and Asarte and all this. So the metamorphosis, it's about the power resulting from the destruction of the Silver Age. It's not meant as a precise chronology, even though the book starts with the creation of the world, but it isn't obvious that the empire uh, was a negative development, nor the Silver Age, necessarily about rules and moral conduct. It's just the mere appearance of it. The empire can be seen as a revelation of all that's been hidden, hidden previously by rhetoric. But the story seems to fit the present Iron Age, the age where Ovid lived, and in a far worse and more intense, magnified way, the current age. No one has gone beyond reason, despite the fact that old Rome, the Middle Ages, and the modern era all sought to base themselves on the rational order. Reason in Apollo uh, is the age of it. It's not the golden age, which Apollo was thought to rule over. Apollo is the age of true knowledge. However, he has ascended in the story to pursuing a human woman, as if to rape her. But that's not the mind of the golden age. Eros is not pure. Civilization is not about the common good, but about the rule of the warrior class. Civilization develops in the midst of the Silver Age and degenerates quickly. The good goes from love to law, from law to brute strength, and that brute strength is either money or violence. And of course, the civilization, as it develops in the Bronze Age, Mining and farming need to support this new order, and it requires more sacrifice since nature won't yield up its goodness at the level voluntarily. It needs to be conquered. From this is born the Iron Age, and this is, you know, what we call politics. You can't even talk about politics in our sense of the word prior to the um, uh, Bronze Age, the late Bronze Age. Politics, the way Ovid defines it, is, is the destruction of stability, the introduction of constant change, Daphne's repulsion against Apollo, is that of reason against creation, one approaching the other as an opponent, ground to be conquered. But in this age, possession is all that you can hope for. It's all that anyone understood. Always understanding, of course, that human affairs are degenerating. The work as a whole is speaking of the degeneration and the constant change. And constant change is based on confrontation and growing despair. This is why Daphne wants to change, to become numb, to check out of this civilization what the Apollos have created. Bronze is a symbol for Mars, warfare. Now, warfare is a natural result of civilization. The elite takes a chunk out of nature and calling it theirs. Instead of, instead of living off it, nature is conquered and forced to bear more than she normally would. This is the key of civilization. And this comes from mass labor, the colossal projects of the ancient world. And labor can only be protected by armed force, lest others seek it. It can only be exploited by armed force. Therefore, nothing is stable. Everything is violence, and there's no difference in the sexual realm as anywhere else. And the story, it goes like this. And this is, this is Apollo. Medicine is mine. What herbs and simples grow in fields and fortress, all the powers I know. I am the great physician called below. Alas, that fields and forests can afford no remedies to heal the lovesick lord, to cure the pains of love. No plant avails, and his own physic the physician fails. Here Apollo is manifesting his nature the rational dissection of nature that lies at the base of civilization, or the exploitation of it. Now, in this case, medicine, the use of herbs and potions to cure human problems, is a subject, but there's a broader point. Given the nature of the female psyche, um, and you know, itself coming from the always-changing river, it can't be so easily controlled. It's a manifestation of the, of the female chaos, so to speak, that seems to lie at the basis of all things and of its own metaphysics. See, in the Golden Age, love was actually love. It required no rules. It was Edenic. It was utopian. The story of Daphne turning into a laurel to escape reason, which is really male conquest in this case, the warrior ethic, uh, ethos, could not have occurred, occurred in, in the Golden Age. The story is a symbol of the Iron Age, yet it's so early in the work 
only in book one. So it must mean that Abed is showing the storytellers in the Iron Age will not be able to grasp the mentality of the gold. But they'll have to explain everything as a matter of conquest. That's all the age can understand. The poets, the, the, the truth tellers, in our age, can't talk about the golden age giving nor, using normal language. There's no, no one can understand it. Everything has to be put in the language of conquest and violence and self-interest, which is very hard to do. Even the metamorphosis goes from the realm of the gods, from the age of gold, and this degenerates into heroes in the middle section and that of man, the bronze, and the iron at the end, books 11 to 15. The other option, of course, is Ovid is foreshadowing the decay of history in the story, using one of the most popular gods to experience his own manifestation. Once history decays, maybe even the gods, if they're to intervene at all, must conform to the nature of the historical cycle. They can't control it. They can't control fate. They can't control destiny. In fact, gods can't control very little. And this is, this is, um, this is one of the reasons that the word God referring to these people is such a big mistake. And I've, I've written on that substantially. And the Cambridge companion to Ovid, um, this is what we read. Among the first creatures to emerge from the earth after the flood is Python, an enormous snake killed by Phoebus, who then introduced to the uh, Pythian games in memory of his triumph. But winners of the games could not be adorned with the laurel, which didn't exist because Phoebus had not yet fallen in love with Daphne. The primordial creation of Python is followed immediately by the games, then by the story of Phoebus' passion for Daphne without any clear-cut separation between human and mythical times nor between different stages of human development, since most of the stories are then joined together by often rather flimsy connections, even the internal sense of chronology disappears. And remember, Apollo and Phoebus are the same person. This is what's happening here. These episodes intrude onto an otherwise you know, smooth flow of history. Well, history isn't smooth. You have, I mean, the Golden Age comes after that of chaos, which is the true origin of all things, the flux. That means the flux is built into everything that exists. Second, the nature of chaos is always just under the surface. So even the golden age wasn't quite golden. If it was, if it's going to decay, then it couldn't possibly be. There has to be some flux element there. At least anyone at the time knew that all is appearance, uh, an, an appearance of stability with chaos and terror lying underneath. Even in the golden age, if it was corruptible, then it wasn't perfect. Third, the issue can be that the early stage, the golden age hadn't even formed yet. All these things speak that knowledge, the way humans have always known it, requires a distinction between subject and object. It requires alienation. It introduces separate things, and separate things have separate interests. The Iron Age is based in part on the nature of these interests almost always being opposed. The Roman Empire then is a crude but necessary imposition of order on a world that would spin totally out of control. We see Apollo acting irrationally. He's acting according to appetite. Is it Cupid's arrow? Is this the sole thing that's controlling him? Could it even be done? Is Ovid forcing the god of reason and gold to experience the results of his own creation? Reason is a tool. I should say, logic is a tool. It can be used for anything. But as humanity decays, or as the chaos becomes more and more visible under the weak veil of civility, reason becomes a tool that serves the passions and appetites. It becomes rationalization. So in the um, companion to, to Ovid, um, Hardy says, the metamorphoses that conclude most of Ovid's tales belong to a world in which nature is mutable, whether spontaneously or under the influence of divine intervention. Time and again, the appearance and physical being of an individual gives way under pressure, the pressure of excessive passions and appetites, evil actions, or accidental transgressions against the gods. So even the god whose essence is reason can't completely live by it, since even he is part chaos, part appetite, which is why the incarnation of Christ is so radically different. There's no reason to believe that chaos, when given proper form, is just ever pure evil. It's not really anything, but it does have the power to overwhelm even the most rational calculation. Reason may justify it, but it can't cause it. Reason is a tool only. Chaos is the engine. It's never irrational to speak the truth. It's interesting that Daphne has taken a vow of virginity. Coming directly from the natural order, Daphne may be mimicking the mentality of the Golden Age. There's nothing so vulgar as physical love that ever remotely symbolized love as such since, of course, the golden age that wouldn't have existed. Virginity is a means to experience a true form of something rather than the physical manifestation. Part of the decay of humanity is that man comes to see appearance as the only reality. Not just a useful tool, not just, not just ornamentation that covers the chaos underlying it, but as the only thing. A form, in this sense, would be the tool by which gods have organized a flux into things, represented by words and images. Um, of course, the concept of logos is a far more refined version of this. All things have a physical manifestation, 
and the ideal cause that the gods have placed on the flux, which is symbolized initially by the snake, the first object to emerge after the flood. To the woman here, Daphne represents pristine creation, the golden age. Her virginity is about seeing past the physical coverings of things, the appearance, and seeing them for what they are. Manifestations of how the forms organize the flux after the death of the snake, after the chaos. But it was Apollo Phoebus that did this. It might be that Apollo, in following his appetite, is showing the chaos that exists within him. Given that the sex drive is the most powerful of all, all it does is take a little nudge from Cupid to overcome his intrinsic reason and to get him to behave according to appetite. Some months ago, we talked about um, the um, the story of Apollo and, and Dionysius. I don't remember when that was. That was maybe early this year. And Apollo comes up quite a bit, um, Dionysius being his counterpart. They can't be total opposites, but they're counterparts, because even flux has reason. But appetite is chaos. It's the chaos that reason has to force itself on. Chaos is not evil, but neither is form. Both have to exist. And it's easily transferred to the age in which Ovid lived. Because it was Caesar's job to stop the oligarchs, as well, of course, as with the common people. They're all motivated by gain. This is why the emperor can claim so-called divine descent, since it's the form that makes anything exist at all, or in this case, anything that has legal regularity, only because the emperor can make it so. Finally, it's also the nature of rape, woman being chaos, or the bringer of chaos, that needs to be, that needs reason to crush it, to control it. Machiavelli said the same thing. Otherwise, no state, no stable existence could occur at all. When we see the, um, the absolute disaster of, of the American presidential campaign, on the one hand, it is completely mindless. No useful information or even logic is utilized. I've worked on campaigns all over the country, and campaigns are exclusively about manipulating others, creating an impression rather than explaining anything. That's just, that's just on the one side. Um, on the other, even this is planned. So there's a, a so to speak, a reason underlying the, the flux, underlying the chaos. The chaos is planned. The chaos is manipulated. Apollo and Dionysius are not opposites. They're counterparts. Even the so-called um, uh, thesis antithesis, which so many people pretend to know anything about, um, even that, um, they're not complete opposites. They couldn't be, or else they couldn't relate to each other at all. Um, divinity and humanity can't be total opposites because one couldn't have any connection with the other if that were the case. So you even have a decay of oligarchy. It's just pure, untrammeled flux, desire, and power, even to the point where even they can't justify themselves. You know, um, I may have said this before, but the constitutional clause against nobility, um, Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, no one talks about this because people think it's just about the prohibition on noble titles. But that's not what it is. It's a barrier against oligarchy. A guarantee that there'd be no privileged class in the U.S. by title or anything else. Alexander Hamilton called it the, the, of all people, called it the cornerstone of Republican government. For so long as they're excluded, there can never be serious danger to, that the government will be any other than that of the people. So this couldn't just be a matter of noble titles. This is the idea of an oligarchy. Now, as false as this is, as far as uh, the Federalists are concerned, they present Republicanism as the antidote to nobility. Now, by nobility... The framers didn't mean aristocracy in Aristotle's sense. They were all partisans of it. Um, aristocracy means ruled by the best and most qualified. It's not just hereditary control. But by nobility, they meant oligarchy, the rule of money, especially inherited money. So it wasn't just formal control over legislative and, and executive power, but a society as a whole. This is all part of the entertainment, the entertainment complex, really then and now. When um, Andrew Jackson um, vetoed the creation of the second bank, he reiterated this very very same concept. He cited the nobility clause as something prohibiting privileges for the benefit of a select few. And when he um, vetoed the bank, he sounds very modern. He says, every man is equally entitled to protection by law. When the laws undertake to add these natural and just advantages, artificial distinctions, titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, laborers, who neither have the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves, have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. So Andrew Jackson is referring to this nobility clause in his rejection of the Second Bank of the United States. 
So what does this all come down to? What we saw tonight is the decay and destruction of the even the Iron Age itself, where even words used to deceive no longer function. They're almost noises and nothing more, because even the images don't refer to anything. When you have Donald Trump saying that because they, you know, the, the murder rate in, you know, Chicago went up in one year of Obama's presidency, therefore Obama's personally responsible, which is what he said, and things very similar to that, you have the decay even of manipulative logic. Even sophistry doesn't work there. And of course, it was very deliberate. The chaos is planned. No um, campaign would have ever let that decay into such pandemonium unless it was decided on beforehand. It doesn't work that way. You had the Golden Age, which of course is the rule of, of Logos purely, and the Silver Age, which is the high point of reason and rationality, and the rule of um, you know, a tempered love over lusts, for example, labor over economy. And the Bronze Age, where the warfare gets worse and worse, and the Iron Age, where even the military aristocracy becomes oligarchs. I'm saying that we're living in an age worse than that, where even the language used to manipulate no longer has meaning, not even as a manipulative tool. We're at a point even where political language now doesn't mean anything, even in the most vulgar sense. And the only thing it seems to happen is to wait for it to burn out. We do what we can to defend ourselves. But we see in the Daphne story so much in uh, uh, Nars- where, where this, this chaos, this in, in, um, inborn contempt that the passions have for the natural order, the contempt that those controlling passions, those controlling uh, the nominal drives have over the innocence of the, of the golden age, that Daphne took a vow of virginity is extremely important. We see what the regime is doing as far as children are concerned. The attacks on Trump are, at least to some extent, motivated by the fact that he's going after some of the most elite child molesters in the country. We know what Joe Biden lets uh, slip on camera, let alone what, he's, what he does otherwise. We see their hatred and contempt for innocence. It's not just that they're going to destroy the Golden Age or the Silver Age. They're going to blot out its memory and humiliate it. There is nothing lower and more disgusting than the present uh, conception of politics. There's nothing worse. Even the lack of water doesn't have water. Thank you, everyone, for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.